Hi everyone, should we get started? Um, thanks for coming everybody. My name is uh, Suzanne Ness, you can call me Sue. And this um, presentation is going to be hopefully interactive and uh, also the business side of things. So um, I'm just going to talk about my experiences with freelancing and being self-employed and in business. And I'm hoping that there might be uh, some of you to also share your experiences or things that you've heard about being in business and that kind of thing so that we can uh, we can all share tactics because I thought it would be fun to do this at a, um, I'm always around other, I'm a writer editor and I'm always around other writer editors often going to those kinds of conferences and yet I always think like how is it different to be um, pitching in different industries, right? So how are graphic designers pitching? Can I get some ideas from them? How are podcasters finding more listeners? Can I get some ideas from them? So. Um, that is uh, one of my goals today. I also have a, a pen and paper at hand for any of your suggestions, so I'm hoping that we can make this not just about me, but uh, more interactive. Um, I actually, uh, I also teach part-time, um, and so I'm often talking at you, and I'll, I'm going to try not to do that this time and be uh, a little bit more interactive than I am uh, in the classroom. Um, uh, the topics that I promised. Oh, I also just got, to, so I've been teaching for about eight years now, and for the very first time, I finally have one of these remote clickers so I can walk around. So you guys can uh, experience that for the first time. I'm looking forward to uh, my class this week finally emerging from behind the podium, usually just like clicking on the mouse to get through my presentation. So it's very exciting. Best Buy is nearby, and I made a, I made a stop today, finally committed to the clicker. So, uh, so this is going to be good. Uh, these are the topics that I uh, had advertised to uh, talk about today, so uh, that's what I'd like to hopefully get through um, as many as possible, and then, uh, as I was saying, to take your suggestions. Can I get a sense in the room of uh, how many people are self-employed or in business here? Oh, excellent. Okay, good. So lots of uh, sharing to do. And what kind of businesses are you guys in? Can I just survey? Businesses? Sure, I'm an actor, writer, podcaster, content awesome. maker. Awesome. Uh, web developer, podcast editor. Oh, great. Travel blogger, freelance writer. Cool. Social media consulting. Oh, good. So there's a nice variety of businesses here, and I'm sure we might probably do a lot of things the same, but we might also do things a little bit differently. So um, I'm going to at each step say, how do you do things? And I'm hoping that you guys will jump in as well. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my path to freelancing. So I've been doing this for about 15 years now. I started off my first two years at a general interest magazine called Saturday Night. It was uh, folded, unfortunately, way back when, but it was a good magazine in the day, and I was its first online editor, so hence my uh, interest in, in tech and all things digital. That's one of the reasons I've actually been coming to PodCamp for um, quite a few years and everything, just to learn and keep up with digital and partly to pass that along to my students but um, also because I just have this natural interest in that kind of thing. I'm not a podcaster although I have gotten into listening to a lot more podcasts in the past year so I've been taking lots of notes this weekend about new podcasts to listen to but, so that's pretty fun. Um, so I started my freelance business when I was laid off in 2002 and I've never looked back. I really like the independence of working on my own um, I originally started with web design and writing just in the interest of diversifying and then uh, when web moved, so that was back in Dreamweaver days, and then when web moved to uh, WordPress, I decided to wrap that part of my business uh, because what I've always wanted to do is writing and editing. So that's my focus now, although ironically I actually teach a class now on WordPress for other uh, for writers. So um, the program that I teach and I help to start a uh, a one-year post-grad uh, post writing program at Humber College, and so I teach in that program. And uh, one of the classes that I teach in the first term is about freelancing, uh, mostly about freelancing. It's called the writer's identity, so it's about trying to find yourself as a writer and decide sort of how you want to um, figure out your career, but it's um, a lot to do with freelancing and being self-employed, because I really feel like even if you are working in uh, an organization, just thinking about your own career as a self-employed person can be really helpful, thinking about it as a business and really putting yourself at the center of your career. When I was laid off, I didn't realize that that kind of thing could happen, so that really made me think a lot more about how can I you know, give to my job, but also get out of my job what I need for my professional development, that kind of thing, too. 
Um, so now I write for a lot of different publications. I'm a bit of a generalist because I'm curious about a lot of things. Um, some of the um, areas of interest that I have right now are education, careers, uh, technology, and books. So those are some areas that I uh, write in. And I also wrote an ebook for my students called Advice a Freelancer. So that's what um, part of this session is derived from as well. I'm trying to expand the ebook now. I'm doing some interviews with other freelancers to um, balance out um, that content there. So that's my path to freelancing. And so that so if anybody who is, uh, I thought it would be helpful because I pose these questions to my students. Uh, are you interested in self-employment? This is for you. So these are the, some of the pros and cons that I uh, that I bring up, and I think they're real. I mean, I feel um, you know insecurity, uh, both financial and in terms of you know you're you're gaining and losing clients, that kind of thing. Um, occasional isolation. This is harder, I think, for some people than others. I happen to work. Uh, well on my own and uh, I don't feel that isolation very much but I see other friends who have tried to go the freelance route and uh, if they leave that's one of the reasons they leave so it's really I think important to develop a network so that's why something like PodCamp is fun to come out of your office and talk to other people. Um, benefits I think is another thing. I have private benefits having um, worked on uh, my own for a long time. You can ask me a little bit about that. They're not the best, but they're sort of a stopgap, and I always feel like um, you know people are saying, oh, I, I have to stick with my my regular uh, job because I get benefits, and I feel like, are you are you really happy about that? You know, you can pay for some benefits, that kind of thing. So I always wonder about that. Um, so then to get to the pros, I, as I mentioned, I really like the independence. I love being able to choose my own projects, um, go in different directions. Occasionally I will take Friday afternoon off and go to the movie. So that is my uh, last point in terms of uh, why I like freelancing. Um, so these are some of the questions that I suggest that uh, people ask in terms of um, self-employment. I feel like the discipline part is really important. Um, finding out whether you're a self-starter, that kind of thing. I happen to be pretty good at uh, being at my desk every morning at 9 a.m. I'm a 9 to 5 -er, because that's when everybody else works, and so uh, that works for me and my clients and that kind of thing. Um, financial up and downs, I would say that is a, a hard thing, so that can be something that you might worry about. Um, and then do you like working on your business as well as doing the work? So that's something where uh, you know, you have to not only think about, you know, what article am I writing today, but also what, uh, what am I going to be writing in two weeks from now, right? So that's a lot about what I'm talking about today, like how do you get new clients and how do you, um, how do you reach out and that kind of thing. Make sure that you're not only busy this week, but you're busy next month. So I'm curious about other people's um, paths to uh, freelancing or self-employment, and if there's anything else to add to the pros and cons, and if there's a pro, uh, what are the pros that keep you going, and if there's a con, and this is for people who might not be self-employed, but what is the con that might keep you from starting uh, freelancing? Anybody want to jump in there with some origin stories or um, how you how your business arc went? Yeah. Um, I actually, that's the reason I'm here, just started uh, doing some freelance editing. Great. I was a writer back in the day, more for like healthcare and uh, software industry. Yeah. So it was more technical. But uh, more recently, I've been finding out there's a pretty big community of ESL some students that need writing help in technical colleges. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, a lot of the you just put up there are kind of areas that I didn't realize I was starting to grapple with. Yeah. But uh, specifically, uh, scoping projects is very tricky. Yes. Not just time intro, but being able to estimate how long things are going to take, mm -hmm. the varying difficulty of different kind of work and writing. I agree. Yeah. I'm, I'm not very good at it so far. It, it doesn't really get easier. <laughs> but it gets a little bit because you can track your time and, and do things like estimate how long projects last, and that could be helpful. Yeah. Just a quick add on to that. I, I yeah. totally agree. I feel like it's like I constantly. Uh, Sort of underestimate how much how long something's going to take me because I'm a perfectionist. So yeah. I, I finish it in a reasonable amount of time, and then I spend a lot of time whatever editing photos, editing more to the travel stuff, and then read over again. Again, by the end of it, so I started using this program to track my time, but then it just stressed me out too much <laughs> <laughs> because I was like, I'm on the clock. You know what I mean? And then I started looking at how much time things were taking me, and it stressed me out more. I just you know, I just like you know, toss that program out. 
And I was like, I'll just do my best, you know. But I, but the thing is, I say yes to a lot of things, and then I end up you know, over my head a little bit. Um, yeah. But I think, yeah, that's a major problem is you want to say yes to everything, but also you want to do a really good job because you're putting your name on it. Yeah. And so, you know, I wish I cared like three to five percent less. <laughs> that's not too huge. It's not at least less. Maybe twenty percent less. That's okay. I'm actually not a perfectionist, and I find that quite helpful. So. <laughs> yeah, I have to make myself go and do a second read through, and yeah, it is. Perfectionism is something I feel like to get over. Is something yeah. you know, like you just. And the more I do it, like deadlines are, are the sort of opposite of perfectionism, right? Because you have to turn something in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So. Yes. Uh, as someone who doesn't freelance but has thought about it, yeah. I think the biggest thing preventing me is the feeling that I don't necessarily have the contacts or the network to even know who to go to to find work. Yeah, yeah. that's that's uh, great. I was actually just going to talk a bit uh, pitching. Did you have a... Oh, I mean, uh, I'm in a similar situation. Yeah. I'm thinking of changing careers. And, yeah. Uh, what he said, but also um, I, because I haven't been doing anything creative or with writing for decades, yeah. I don't really have a body of work, yeah. so uh, I don't feel that I have anything uh, to show to try to um, find uh, uh, freelancing jobs. Yeah, you're just like my students, right? How do I get work if I don't have the samples to get the work, right? And I always suggest to them, like, uh, so I, I never advocate writing for free because that brings us all down, right? <laughs> but if yeah, if we are um, <laughs> yeah, if we are uh, if you're students and you're in your writing program, that is the time for to hustle, and you can take a lower rate, right? So if you go and like write, you know, like five blog posts for a low rate that I would never accept as a professional, then you can get those um, clips. When I started out, I started writing for community newspapers, like. The Annex Gleaner. Anybody ever seen Gleaners around the city? That was uh, it's like the Post City newspaper of way back when. And uh, but that just got me some clips there. And then you do need something that you can show to prospective editors, you know. And then I feel like it's trade up, trade up, right? And so I traded up to the point where I'm like writing for publications that I that I like. Also, I think starting a blog is can be awesome, right? Because then you really have a sample of your voice, and you know you do have that regular. It shows that you can be disciplined to do that regular output and that kind of thing. So those are the couple of things that I really suggest um, to students to uh, to get those samples, right? Because I do feel like they're pretty essential. Yeah. Yeah, just to tag on to the writing a blog. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd say I recommend writing and using it as a marketing tool for yourself because mm -hmm. when you promote your blog or even if you post them as articles on LinkedIn, um, it opens up the doors. I've gotten a lot of people contact me through LinkedIn just to because of the articles I posted. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, I've just actually started using LinkedIn a bit more myself with those posts and everything, and it, it's good for engagement. Yeah. Just one last thing to add on to that is that um, I actually have a blog and I have a portfolio page on my blog, which I send editors to, which are clips from other articles online, so you have the double entendre going on. I'd also say to you, don't overestimate the quality of writing. I, there's a lot of pretty shit writers who are getting paid money. <laughs> To, to write, and I was like, take, take a look around, I guarantee you'll find find five articles where you're like, I'm better than this, and use that as confidence. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Also, that's another good way is just reading other people's stuff, right? You get a sense of what the tone is in terms of different industries that you're wanting to get into and that kind of thing. So like, really read in the industry that you want to write about, I think, is, is quite helpful. Um, just to move on to, uh, okay, let's try freelancing. Um, so let's talk about pitching. There we go. Uh, so I'm just going to say what pitching is in terms of uh, as writers and editors do it, and then ask about what kind of things, how you pitch in different industries. So a pitch is a, basically, now it's an email format. It used to be a letter format. Um, it, it outlines a compelling story idea, introduces a project to a writer, provides all of the information that is to move ahead with the project or assignment, right? So it's quite detailed, especially if you are new to pitching an editor. Um, it has a particular format. Um, so usually you want to try and find that compelling story that's not covered anywhere else. You want to have a timely hook, so a reason to do the story now. I find the hardest part of being a freelance writer is to 
find the news before it's news, right? And then get uh, get an original story idea in there. So I'm always trying to be a sponge. When I come to conferences like this, I'm always listening, you know, or trying to find out what the next thing is that somebody's working on, that kind of thing. Uh, it's easier if you uh, get known a little bit or you have a portfolio of, of samples and that kind of thing. Um, just because the editor then believes that you can get the story, right? So if you say, oh, I'm going to interview Justin Trudeau, well, they have to have some confidence that you can actually connect with him, right? So, you know, at a lesser level, whoever you can connect with, um, they want to believe that you can get the story. So if you've had experience talking to a certain kind of uh, interviewee, then it's more likely that you will actually get that story. Um, or if you have a special expertise, and I'm always suggesting this to my students as a way of getting in there. So, for example, I had a student who, uh, she wrote this great piece about um, working in, uh, or being in an ethnic nursing home, right? And so she had, her grandmother was uh, in that situation, right? So she was uh, somebody who had direct contact and experience with somebody that she could uh, interview, and uh, it went on to get published later on, so that was a great uh, thing. So if you can ever find that kind of uh, expertise. I wrote a story, for example, uh, about my mom's uh, search for her birth family in her uh, in her 60s. And uh, so that was a story that only I could tell. And it was, uh, I think, something that uh, I could combine my writing experience and my personal experience as well. You should always also be familiar with the publication whenever you're pitching a magazine, or even if you're approaching a client, um, just be really familiar with magazines. Uh, if you're doing a pitch to a monthly, it should be at least six months that you should read of the publication. Um, if it's a, a blog or something, I would say at least a few weeks back, um, just to get a sense of their tone. You always want to Google in the publication to make sure they haven't done the story already. Um, so those are some things that go into uh, a writer's pitch. Um, So um, I'm just going to talk about also reaching out to clients, because this is another way that I uh, get business. So I also write for corporate clients. And uh, right now I'm doing a lot of work for colleges and universities, so a lot of writing for alumni magazines and research magazines and websites and whatever they want me to do and brochures and that kind of thing. Um, so one way that I get that work is I introduce myself as a writer and outline the services that I can provide. Um, it opens a door if you connect uh, for further communication, and I just write a structured letter, so sent as an email. Um, it's similar to the pitch, but it's basically introducing me and my interests in, uh, in writing and focusing on my writer skills, connecting with the organization. So I try to spend a lot of time on an organization's website. If I'm reaching out to another, a new college or university, I try to figure out what kinds of publications do they have? Are they worth p pitching uh, in terms of, you know, telling them, uh, focusing on my magazine writing experience if they have an alumni magazine, uh, for example. Um, and so I often will target and generate a list of contacts um, through websites, directories, and LinkedIn of people that uh, I would like to reach out to. I look for relevant, relevant job titles. So for me, it's often communications director, communications manager, that's the kind of title that I look for. Um, where possible, if it's ever possible, I like to try to warm up the connection, so if I know somebody who's worked there, it's ideal to get an introduction. But I actually do quite a bit of cult outreach, and uh, it's still something that is, uh, is worthwhile, I find. And then you want to reach out systematically and try to keep in touch. Um, this I call it business development, um, so I try to do it ideally on a regular basis so that I can uh, have always new clients who might be at least aware of who I am and that I want their business. Um, and so I find that's a way of, of reaching out. Uh, I find there's pros and cons. So actually, like the cold outreach success rate um, is you know, rumored to be somewhere in the 5%. So if you reach out to 100 people, you would get five people who would say, yeah, sure, I'll hire you as a writer. But actually, if you get five clients, that's enough to keep you uh, busy You know, when you uh, incorporate the other ways of getting business, like referral and repeat uh, work and that kind of thing. So I do find even though um, some people are a bit negative on cold outreach, but I found it's just another tool, right? And if it's especially if you are wanting to make windows into an industry, it can be helpful. Um, that said, it's a long sales cycle sometimes. So I am writing an article, actually it's uh, three or four articles right now for a magazine that I first pitched probably three years ago. 
and just kept in touch, kept on the radar and that kind of thing. And finally, they had an opening, and uh, you know, I, I wrote, I had a client who gave me quite a few thousand dollars worth of work last year, and they had a mat leave, right? So I just kind of had kept in touch, and, and then suddenly they had uh, a space or an opening for uh, for a writer, and so I wrote um, quite a few of their publications uh, last year. And uh, I find this is really accessible way also, the cold approach, because my students are always, again, that how do I get work if I don't have work kind of question. Um, this is one way that's successful, because I feel like it's a bit, the whole, oh, just get referrals is a tiny bit snobby and insider, because like, how do you get referrals if you don't have any connections, right? So this is a, actually a way that um, makes it possible. And I do, uh, I've almost never had somebody say, why are you contacting me? You're terrible, right? I've almost always had, not everybody says that, but I feel like the one or two people who have said it uh, are like, thanks, writers never reach out, and uh, I'll keep you on file kind of thing, right? So um, I, I've had a fairly positive experience, and it's another thing you're looking at in terms of getting work. Can you go back to the previous page so I can get a quick picture sure. of the cold approach? And so in terms of websites and directories, like, for example, I've lately been exploring, again, um, getting some government work, which is super hard to get into, and uh, so there are, for example, government directories where you can just go and look up in different government ministries who's a communications director, and uh, those job titles, and they often will have the email address and the phone number, and so that can be quite helpful. Um, so, up to you. What are your pitch tips? Are, are there other, do other industries have different uh, ways of uh, pitching that are different from this? Um, any best practices to share? Any other ways? Because I'm always interested in like, what are other ways of, of getting business? Uh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not a writer at all. I'm more on social media. But what I find is, uh, like if you look at an article on, on the web page, it usually says writer by whatever. Yeah. You click on their name and you just kind of technically stalk them and basically mm -hmm. check their social media. Yeah. If you like they have an Instagram uh, page and you notice that they like like golf a lot, then I would always go on their articles and kind of just make comments, oh love love this article. But then when when there's a point to, of interest that you can bring up the golf in some way, they'll they'll uh, automatically connect in some way. That's how you can get your warm outreach. Excellent. So I think that, I don't know if that works for anyone if anyone's done that, but that's kind of a technique that I think of getting that warm connection. Great, thanks. Yeah, I've been thinking of like ways to boost my social and everything, so yeah, that's a great one to try. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I would Google whatever your niche is for writing, there's often communities of people there. So for example, I'm part of a, um, a, a group called Dream of Travel Writing, and there's a lot of different people there. And what, what that gives you access to is a, what's called the Travel Magazine Database, and it's like 450 travel magazines, and they're broken down by, on how to pitch editors based on subject matter and this kind of stuff. So like Google whatever it is, education writing, travel writing, whatever, and you might find there's already a community there that's like uh, really trying to promote that um, yeah, idea. So I found that incredibly useful because I'm never cold pitching a magazine. Like it's like it's a breakdown of every magazine I could pitch. Excellent. Yeah, I just wrote that <laughs> that yeah. down. Thanks for that suggestion. Yeah, yeah no, I'm right. always looking for new uh, new ways. There's actually a, uh, um, an organization that I joined uh, just a couple of years ago called the American Society of Journalists and Authors, ASJA, and uh, I've belonged and volunteered for a long time with the Canadian one called PWAC, uh, Professional Writers Association of Canada, which is a nice organization, good for peer networking and that kind of thing for me. But um, ASJA actually has a similar directory for like most magazines kind of thing, so it's another place that's helpful. Um, there's another one called uh, Freelance Success for Writers, and they often will profile magazines too. I think it's like 100 bucks a year, so it's even uh, less expensive, but it's, uh, yeah, there's some good resources out there. Was PUAC worth your time? Yeah. I, I meet like lots of writers. I would suggest coming out to like different writers organizations and seeing if it's for you. PWAC turned out to be the one that's for me. You know, uh, I belong to PWAC uh, Editors Canada, which is the Editors Association, and uh, ASJA at the moment. And uh, yeah, I find it I find it more helpful for um, peer like you know meeting uh, writers and 
Um, we have a monthly seminar series uh, with QAC. I, I volunteer on the Toronto board, and uh, so that can be really helpful to just some of that professional development. We did a, a session in um, January about advanced interviewing techniques, for example, which was quite helpful, and so that kind of thing and that connecting. Now I have you know some of the people that I've met in that organization are my my friends and writer buddies, and I can call up and ask important questions, right? So that could be helpful. Um, anybody else in terms of pitching techniques? Yeah. Um, so I'm in communications, uh, and so I've very often been the person that you would be pitching to. Oh, great. Um, Hello. Yeah. For, uh, Tell us everything. Yeah. So uh, for like government, I've done it for community newspapers, now I'm currently doing it for not-for-profit. Uh, so my one tip would be whatever organization you're researching, uh, make sure it's as little work as possible for me. Um, so if you already have something all set up and ready to go, I'm very likely to say yes, because you're constantly looking for ways to promote your organization and everything like that. So if you have a plan already set out, I'm more than happy to go along with it, um, particularly if you can tell me like why it would be successful and all that kind of thing. Um, another thing I would suggest, like if you're writing articles or something along those lines, if you make sure that it's well researched and um, applicable to my organization. So if you've got an idea that you've already thought of, um, and maybe you're doing it on like a blog or something like that, uh, send it to organizations. Like look for the comms director in organizations that are relevant to your topic, uh, and they'll be a lot of times like I'm always looking for social media stuff to share, right? So it's it's always that daily grind to find something that's relevant and that's gonna create engagements, but especially now that um, some of the algorithms and stuff are changing so that you require more engagement. Um, so yeah, if you've got something like that, pitch it the, at the very least, it can help you get um, more share, more interaction and, and more, um, I can't think of my words right now, but you know, more people looking at your stuff, basically. Um, so that's, that would be what I would recommend. Thanks so much for your tips. Yeah, probably you'll be smart later, but <laughs> I appreciate that. Oh, I'm all right. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else with, uh, with tips? Okay, moving on a little bit. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about networking, kind of what we're doing here. So these are just some of the tips that uh, I've already talked a little bit about peer networking. So Editors Canada and QAC are a couple that I mentioned I, uh, I like to volunteer with. I find that a volunteer role can help to get um, an even better knowledge. Um, we do have PWAC events uh, regularly in Toronto. PWACToronto.org is our uh, our address. We want to look out for the next one that we're having. Um, I feel like that is good for referrals. Uh, intel on the industry, you know, like what are magazines uh, that I can write for, that kind of thing. Um, helpful for subcontracting, uh, just for support. Um, but the new idea that I'm trying is networking with groups outside my peers. So I just, for example, last month went to a, uh, an event by the Registered Graphic Designers uh, as Association. So I'm like trying to meet other people who are in different industries, see if we can cross promote because I feel like, um, you know, they might need a writer, and whereas I can recommend all sorts of writers, they might, and a graphic designer might not know as many writers, right? So just kind of making those connections, and that's one of the reasons that I go to PodCamp is to meet new people like that and to meet people in different industries that are not my industry. Um, and like, for example, going to uh, do uh, networking with potential clients, right? People who could actually hire me. So for me, uh, things like I went uh, last week to the uh, Clean Marketing Association for the first time, they had a mixer and that kind of, just to meet some people who are doing different agencies and everything. So that was helpful. So that's a new thing that I'm trying. Um, in terms of networking tips, I've actually written a couple of articles on networking. I do it with my, my students, and uh, some of the things that I tell them is that the goal is to form meaningful relationships, not just to hand out your business card. So you want to try and make a connection with people. Um, I would say like two or three meaningful connections rather than ten hellos. So uh, if you can really um, get chatting with people, and you're not asking for we're here, almost asking like what can I do for you. Um, if you can research the events uh, in advance and have a game plan, that can also, I think, be, uh, be quite helpful. So um, those are some uh, things that I try to do as networking. It's funny because we all had a networking event last night, didn't we, at the, uh, at the after party. So hopefully you were able to put some of those things into practice. Um, I find the elevator pitch can be helpful too. I always have my students practice 
to the point where they're, where they're like, could we not practice it <laughs> anymore? Because I, I feel it's helpful to repeat a few times. Um, so the elevator pitch, of course, is the description of your business in 20 seconds or two sentences, the time it takes for a medium-sized uh, elevator ride. Uh, and you're practicing your firm high, uh, handshake and eye contact, right? So helpful, nice firm handshake, eye contact, really trying to make that personal connection. Should we practice? Could I, turn, could I invite you to turn to your neighbor, preferably a neighbor who you have not met before? Just like try one elevator yeah, pitch. <laughs> Compliment it if you like the business card and then put it away, right? So don't just head, grab the business card, put it in your pocket, do the whole thing. It's a thing we do here, right? There's different, I think, uh, reactions of different cultures to business cards, but that's how I found uh, it's helpful. And then later on, the follow up, right? So it's not no, um, no good to have just a business card in your pocket or on your desk later on. It's helpful to make that uh, follow up connection through LinkedIn, right? So LinkedIn or send an email or do something with the business card so it's not just in your pocket. Um, yes? And also follow up quickly while they still remember who you are. Excellent, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes like if you're trying to remind yourself who they are, like you could just write a little note on the business card, right? So then you remember um, that connection. Um, so that's, those are my thoughts on networking. Anybody have some things to share about your experiences with networking? Any tips, uh, best practices, or any way that it differs by different industry? Yeah. Um, one tip I heard a long time ago that I thought was very useful, that if you have a business card, and I guess this works best if it's just a one-sided business card, but you could put a sticker on the back that would say, we met at PodCamp. Oh. And cool. so then if whoever receives it is like, oh yeah, you know, and then it helps them remember you. Oh, that's great. Yeah, smart. Yeah. I like I run a 
a monthly event called uh, DevTO, which is like mostly developers, uh, tech, like people who web design and stuff. Uh, but there's other industry people that should show up to this. I was just talking to you. Graphic designers or anyone, it's a great opportunity. People, people are usually startups. They need people in social media or people to write content for them. So I think if you step out of your actual niche to kind of explore those, those are areas where you can get some uh, contacts and networking. Excellent. I would say just something small that I just have learned throughout the years is like, make sure you're not just giving your elevator pitch, but like genuinely listening to theirs because it seems like. If, if it feels like you're networking, then you're probably really screwing up because <laughs> you know, you're like, okay, I've said my pitch to them, I've said my pitch to them, but like, give them a chance to like, and like, literally stay on like, and what do you do? Give me your business card, let me hear your story, and then like, follow up on that. And I find like the more you're actually listening, the better it's gonna go, you know, because the more they feel like you genuinely give a shit and aren't just there to make it <laughs> yeah. rain with your yeah. business cards, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, to I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, so I, I always feel kind of like dirty in networking events because it's very transactional. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, ugh. But um, I find that to, to get that authentic um, conversation going, I start off with asking a lot of questions that are not work-related. Um, to get them to open up about general interests and then that way making connection and then talking about what you do for work. And then it is actually offended. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I, I always ask, what do you do for fun? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually harder for a lot of people. Yeah. It's like, I just do a job. I have my oh, business fine. answer ready. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I mostly come to PyCamp for all the tools that I've never heard of. And, and uh, mm -hmm. that's my key thing. So my two cents here is um, card cam, the, the app. You can just uh, scan people's cards, and it goes directly into uh, a CRM, and you have their card oh, wow. right there. Cool. Card cam. Yeah. Yeah. So usually I, I lose people's cards and things like that this yeah. way. Sure. Do it right away, it's captured, and it's always with you. Oh, that's, that's great. great. That's smart idea. Cool. Not to call on the authenticity yeah. networking thing, but um, I, I, someone, when I was talking about like how, how you go about starting that conversation and finding common interests, because you had it in one of your slides, actually called that inferencing and he likened it to that cold reading thing they do for like it, uh, sort of guessing about someone's background in the history. And it made me feel a little bit weird about it until what clicked was that it's like you guys are saying, you're always looking for that thing that you actually both have in common, that you actually are genuinely interested in. Yeah. And when you get to the point, it's effortless. Like You've already established that sort of rapport. So, even if you talk about something business related afterwards, it doesn't go to track them, and it just adds to it. Like, I think you can be friends and colleagues. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. I think that's the thing. It's like, I legitimately meet somebody, and I'm like, I would be happy to go for a beer with you and yeah. not talk about yeah. this. But yeah. I also might go to Dev Tio. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. Those, like those yeah. things are not mutually exclusive. Yeah. 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 Hence, a lot of your friends being writers from PUI. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a natural one, if you're at an event together, is what do you think of the event, right? Mm -hmm. And that kind of open ended question as well, like, what do you think it's a who is your favorite speaker? It was Sue. <laughs> <laughs> End of question, you know, like asking open-ended questions and that kind of thing, and then connecting about the event, because we're all here because we're interested in the topics here and everything. So what was your favorite session? What, you know, like uh, how, how long have you been coming here? That kind of thing, things that can be conversation starters. We all have that in common this weekend, so that's a good place to start. Um, moving on. Uh, is there time to talk about time management? So, <laughs> um, yes, I think, uh, yeah, we're still good. <laughs> um, I feel like this is such a big issue for self-employed people, freelance writers. It's certainly a question that all my students have because as soon as they're in the program, they're trying to manage all these assignments and everything, and I'm like, just wait till you actually get out there and you're in a workplace and you're even tighter squeezed for time. So it's a topic that's quite a favorite. I feel like it's really essential for freelancers, and uh, it's good to prioritize your essential tasks, and, but at the same time fit in those kind of business development, you know, reach kind of things. Um, I feel like it's the discipline to prioritize, but also like being flexible enough to take advantage of opportunities, right? So I told a whole bunch of people about PodCamp, and there's a whole bunch of people who didn't come. <laughs> I feel like, what else are you doing this weekend to not be learning about digital stuff and you know becoming smarter and that kind of thing? So I feel like. You know, they say, yes, I have projects. Well, you know, like what kind of projects could you 
maybe you could bring your work here, or that kind of thing, right? So being flexible if something comes up to, to uh, attend a networking event, or you know, um, have have your priorities and meet all your deadlines, but at the same time um, be taking advantage of opportunities that come up. Just yeah. A ten second add-on, just yeah. other tools. Uh, Trello, I found has been pretty helpful, um, just as far as like I just literally use it for articles and when they're due, and I put the blurb from the editor onto there, so it's all prioritized. I have three lines of doing, need to do, and done. And it's like, the, and then I get a I sort of a satisfaction when I see all the green and the things I've already done, and I don't get stressed with the things I have to do. Um, but I put only the most, the most urgent stuff, because otherwise the to-do list gets out of control. So it's just like, just this is exactly what you need to do, when you need to do it, Trello.com, they have apps, um, and they're also collaborative. So if you're working with somebody else, <coughs> if you're a small business of three or four people, you can all access that and add and edit. That's great. Yeah, Trello's a really good uh, good one. Good to have that kind of project management software. Um, I find working in a quiet place is helpful for me, um, where you're not going to be disturbed. I have a home office, so that is my uh, center. Um, using tools like to-do lists and calendars, whatever works. Um, I find if I am working on a project, I want to be not bothered. I still will sometimes turn off email. I almost always turn off social and just check it at various times during the day. Um, creating a work back schedule for uh, projects, like I do a lot of article writing, and the biggest time unpredictability factor is how can I schedule interviews, right? Because that's dependent on somebody else's schedule, somebody else's schedule, not mine. So it's like reaching out to people for interviews, and so I think, when do I need to have the, all the interviewing done in order to have time to write the draft, in order to have time to proofread, in order to have time to submit, right? So I call that a, a work back schedule in terms of here's the deadline, what are all the things that need to be done so that I'm not stressed out and doing everything the night before. Still sometimes happens the night before, but ideally not with the help of a work back schedule. And then also I find setting schedules can be really helpful too. As I mentioned, I'm a nine to fiver. Uh, I really feel like um, that can help me to structure my work day. I actually build in breaks to my work day. So I take my lunch around you know, 1 to 1.30. I watch talk shows so that I'm like complete mental break from what I'm doing. And then I, when I get back, I feel like I've given myself a lunch break. And I'm actually more productive if I, uh, if I do that. If I end up skipping it, sometimes I do. I'm so busy that I need to. But for the most part, I find if I take that time just mentally to be away, I'm like more excited to get back to work for the afternoon than the time So I, I schedule in um, that kind of thing. Uh, the getting things done rule. Anybody heard of the getting things done uh, approach? Uh, basically, one of the rules is that if a message can be answered in under two minutes, you do it immediately. If not, you file away for your time set aside. It's a whole um, sort of time management uh, program, which I find uh, pretty helpful in, in thinking about ways to uh, to manage your time. We talked a little bit about perfectionism, which I suggest avoiding if you can. <laughs> Procrastination, of course. I also find multitasking. If anything, I am a unitasker. I love just doing one thing at the same time. I know it's not that practical in terms of, you know, social has to be responded to and that kind of thing, but whenever I can, like, turn everything off and just work on one project for two hours, it's really great. Uh, because I'm a writer, we do have this myth about writer's block. I'm like, writers who get writer's block don't get paid or don't get paid, don't pay their rent, right? That. So it's one of those things like, well, I, I have to get over that quickly, you know? So uh, I don't know if there is like graphic designer's block or <laughs> other, <laughs> other blocks or that kind of thing, but uh, I find if you're trying to um, make a living at it, uh, you have to find ways to get around it, right? So it's not to say that I'm never blocked, it's just to say that I, I have tools, you know, like I go for a walk, or I talk to somebody, or I brainstorm a list of topics, or I structure an article rather than diving into it, you know, all those things, because I'm like, if my deadline is at the end of the week, I'm not going to let my editor down, right? So, uh, yeah, I find that's helpful. Um, think about what you can say no to, ideally. Um, use an egg timer uh, to set times to avoid interruptions. I actually have a nice sand hourglass now that goes for 30 minutes. It's really fun. And uh, so if I'm having a hard time getting focused on the task, I will just turn over my 30 minutes. I'll be like, I only have to do 30 minutes. If it's not working for me today, I can start the article tomorrow, right? But usually after a few minutes, you can get, uh, get down to task. Um, this is how I mentioned about like scoping things. So timing out how long it takes to do particular tasks uh, can help you budget for next time. So how long does it take for me to write uh, an article with one source? How many? How long does it take to write an article where I've interviewed eight people and have to write 2,000 words? Right? Like I try to time those things so that I can 
figure out how much I have to budget for that. It's kind of a loose thing, you know, like I sort of figure out what I'm more in the zone for and that kind of thing. Um, and I also use like my times of higher energy kind of thing in terms of, you know, if I really feel like I'm into an article and I don't have a, a ton of deadlines, maybe I'll go and unitask on that article if I'm really in the zone and, and finish it. So I try to use my energy in that way and then focus on high return tasks, the 80-20 rule, right, where 80% of your uh, energy should be put into the 20% of your tasks or clients that give you the most value. Uh, how about you guys? What are your time management tips? Any tips to share? Any resources like lock up the internet resources? I have uh, my students, this is one of the things that they really worry about. So a couple of the su their suggestions were on top of the fridge is a good place for your smartphone or with your mom. Right? So if you just hand it over your smartphone <laughs> to your mom and request that she not give it back to you, that's also an effective um, technique. So uh, any other suggestions? Time management? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this sounds a little hippy-dippy, but um, it just being like really aware of the times that you're most productive like for me, I'm not a morning person, and even if I wake up at 6 in the morning and turn off my phone and everything, work on a task, I'm going to be much slower than if I were to do it at like 2 p.m. So really understanding when you're most productive and um, dedicating time to work on a project that is like no distraction, and you just hammer it out and then take a break throughout it. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I, I, I'm also not a morning person. Yeah. yeah. Other tips? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to go back, but uh, when you were talking about uh, writer's block, and yeah. I think any kind of block, yeah. one of the tips that they gave in the journalism program I took was, there's other words I think that you have for it too, but free fall writing, where you literally just verbal diary, you get, just anything that comes to your mind, it doesn't have to make sense, it doesn't have to be honestly meaningful. You just every day have a, a ritual of writing 50, 20 minutes of nothing or something oh. or whatever. And then when, when it comes to a moment where you actually need to write something, it just makes it more fluid and effortless. Yeah, some, bit, some people do something called, uh, the, there's a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron and the morning pages, and yeah, some people find that really helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's an app called Freedom that I quite like, and then another one called Stay Focused. Oh, great. Right. So Stay Focused, just, you pick the you pick the sites that you have, that you do not have the discipline to stay off of. Oh. <laughs> and it blocks them for you, or like, you can put time limits, so like, you can only spend, 10 minutes on Facebook every day, so Stay Focus is free. Freedom is a subscription one. They're actually by the same people, I think. Cool. Um, but I, that's a helpful one. For me. I use both of those, so I can second that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other tips? Yeah. Um, I think it's just like the basics, right? Like don't get distracted. Yeah. There's one that I recently found out about that I haven't been able to use that much, but it seems pretty cool. Uh, I think there are free versions, but the one called Forest is $3, and it's kind of a game, they, they gamify not touching your phone, oh. where the idea is the longer you don't touch your phone, the more this like little uh, sprout like grows into a tree, and uh, so the idea is as soon as you touch your phone or do anything with your phone, the tree dies, and so oh. you want to try not to kill the tree, you get to build like a forest over time of all the trees, it's like a little trophy room of all your trees. I like, I've read articles about it, that's what led me to it and recommended it to friends yeah, and like right. a lot of people have been really into it, it's oh, really addicting, so. Awesome. Cool, yeah. Just like I always said, scheduling and everything, but even if you have a to-do list and you know what you're supposed to do, I find I lose a lot of time when I'm switching tasks. So if you just have a very clear list of like the three things you need to do today, or just scheduling blocks of time for everything rather than just a list of stuff to do so you always know what you're supposed to be doing. So I'm like, should I write this thing? Or I'll, maybe I'll, I don't feel like I'll do some editing, but then I have a research to do and I'll look at like 19 articles. Um, so that's where I just wind, I wind up like losing hours. So if you're planning just the day before about how you should spend every hour, it can be a lot more effective. That's great, yeah. Yeah, just for, I'm somebody who's on to-do lists and it just gets overwhelming. So I use a program called Wonderlist, like mm -hmm. W-U-N-D-E-R-L-I-S-T. Basically, I have it organized into personal and professional, and I have subcategories for all my professional stuff, from like social media, for freelancing, for blogging, for whatever. The great part about that is it's connected to my email, so for tasks I know I need to get done, I'll set a due date on it, and it'll arrive at 9 a.m. on that day in my inbox, so when I check my email in the morning, it's there. So it's like, so it could be something as small as I need 
Cliff, and I know I want to follow up with him on Tuesday. And my personal, I would just put email Cliff, boom, set the due date, I don't have to worry about it, and then at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, it arrives. And then I just do it, do it quickly, delete the email. So it's, I found that to be uh, huge for me, one list. Yeah. Cool. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, Evan Pagan's uh, Wake Up Productive. Well, he was giving it away free, so don't worry about it. Uh, uh, illegally downloading it or something, but there, his video course was the best uh, wake up uh, time management program. So what was it called again? Yeah, wake Evan Pagan's Wake Up Productive. Is that Who's that? Hey. It's a video course. Great. Cool. Um, And uh, that's all on time management. Do we have more tips? Yes. Um, not just that, but maybe in the spirit of networking, yeah. do you think there's a place that we can set up to just share contacts? Yeah. So that we can get it seems like this would be pretty valuable right now. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. I like it normally would be Google Docs, but that's, I don't know if that's something we do in fly. Yeah. Uh, Does everyone know business cards? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. There's a lie detail. I'll look you in the eyes. Uh, if you are. Uh, interested in getting in touch with me, that's my uh, handle on Twitter if you want to follow. Um, if, you, if you send, I don't know how to be productive but, uh, about it, but if you send an email to me, I could um, link everybody together. That might work. Or you can take over the breakout room thing. 229. Sure. Space. Yeah. Anybody interested? You can head over there. I think we're probably uh, at time, yes? Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.